So uh, Stefan set the scene quite nicely. Uh, the purpose of my talk will be to go a, lit a little bit more into detail about what the Delta set is all about. Um, I mean, the most important conclusions you already know, Stefan already briefly told about them as well. Uh, we did this great comparison together with a lot of different collaborators, many of whom are already here again, so I'm very glad to see that. And in the end, we got to actually this final figure. I think this is the main result of the Delta paper, where we compared, I think, about 40 different methods. And this matrix showed, in terms of Delta, how they, these different methods compared. And the main conclusion was we're actually doing quite okay. If we're using uh, recent methods, their agreement is very good. Some methods don't agree that well with other methods, but in those cases, we don't really need to worry because these are deprecated methods, methods which are in many cases already discouraged to be used. So in fact, this was a very comforting message. Now, what was all behind this? Well, behind all of this information was a gauge which we introduced at some point, I think back in 2014, uh, which we call delta. And delta is actually a measure to compare equations of state. So the delta paper is all about how do equation of state predictions between different codes vary. So what we did, we asked all of you, all of the collaborators involved in this project, to have a look at a test set, a benchmark set of different materials. In this case, 71 elemental crystals. So we provided all of the code developers or expert users with an input structure, and we asked them, please predict an equation of state around this uh, initial structure. Uh, don't let everything relax, just keep the structure fixed, but only change the volume. Predict an energy versus volume curve, and then we will compare element by element to other codes and express the difference between equations of state. And this difference we expressed as a root mean square difference, which we call delta, or in this case, if we're dealing with elemental crystal I, delta I. Since we have 71 different elemental crystals, we can average that difference over all of the elemental crystals, and we get one number, one energy distance, which expresses the difference between two codes in terms of equation of state predictions for the elemental crystals. Now, there's much more information in that data set than just this pure single number. I mean, let's do the math. We have 52 different codes, potential settings, which have been evaluated. Actually, 53. This morning at 8 a.m., I got a 53rd set. So we will add this one uh, by Questal on our website as soon as possible. So, but let's, for my mathematics, let's just keep it like that. 52 different methods, which had a look at 71 elemental crystals. Well, this is maybe the upper limit. Not all codes were able to treat all 71 elements, but just to sketch the upper limit, 71 elements. For each of these elements, we asked to do seven calculations, seven volume points for which the energy was calculated to reconstruct an equation of state. So if we uh, take all of this together, we see we get, al we get almost 26 thousand data points, 26,000 calculations. And the only thing we get from that is this matrix, which doesn't contain 26,000 numbers. Well, I'm not saying that we need to have a look at all 26,000 data points, but I hope you feel that there's much more data in this comparison between codes than this single delta number. So let's have a look at what's behind all of these comparisons, whether there's more information to be got from the comparison. And in particular, let's look at three uh, physical properties which can typically be gotten from an equation of state. Equilibrium volume, bulk modulus, and pressure derivative of the bulk modulus. These are things people are used to deal with. And in the course of this project, we told people, do not look at them. Let's just look at the equation of state. But what if we now do the post-analysis and have a look at these properties anyway? Can we extract some extra uh, physical uh, intuition or some extra information about the comparison between codes. Well, how are we going to compare these? Let's just say, for example, we're comparing two different codes, code one, code two, and we look at the, the equilibrium volumes that are predicted by means of these two codes. We need to compare them. We could do that in a similar way as delta, just expressing everything in terms of one number, for example, a mean absolute deviation. But let's not do that because we then lose a lot of resolution about the uncertainties or the agreement between the different codes. 
So what I propose to do instead is to do a regression analysis. We will have a look at the equilibrium volumes as predicted for the 71 elemental crystals by code 1 on the y-axis and by code 2 on the x-axis. We will put them together in a scatter plot and do a regression analysis. The advantage of that is that we don't express everything in a single number, but we are actually uh, able to extract different components of the agreement. On the one hand, we have a regression line. A regression line which is some sort of predictable part of the error. Uh, we can correct for it. There can be a systematic deviation between the two codes in terms of, for example, their equilibrium volume predictions. But there's also some scatter on that regression line, which we can express in terms of a standard error of the regression, for example. It gives us an error bar. An error bar which is actually the intrinsic fluctuation in, in the quality of our predictions over that entire test set of crystals. And then finally, also very interesting and not to be underestimated, are outliers. Are there data points, elemental crystals, for which the agreement between codes is much worse than the bulk of all the calculations? This is something which is very interesting to know whether there are bugs or improvements that can be made code by code. We could apply such a regression analysis quite naively. Uh, I would not recommend that as well uh, because in fact there are quite some correlations to take into account as well. We did some analysis a few years ago uh, where we had a look at hypothetical equations of state and just because equilibrium volume, bulk modules and bulk module derivative are all derived from the same energy versus volume curve, there are actually correlations between those properties. And in this paper we saw that, for example, if we look at materials with a very uh, small bulk modulus, so very shallow equations of state, the error, the intrinsic sensitivity of the, uh, of the um, equilibrium volume becomes much larger. You can shift the equilibrium volume much more without actually affecting the equation of state much. And the same goes for the bulk modulus. A material with a very small uh, volume will have a very large error bar intrinsically by means of the shape of the equation of state on the bulk modulus. So these are things we should best take into account, which we can do by not applying an ordinary least squares regression, by a but a weighted least squares regression. We just weigh every data point by its own inverse bulk modulus, for example, if we're looking at the, equi uh, the equilibrium volumes. Why would we do this? Well, maybe just take a little bit a step from the precision aspect and have a, an example from accuracy, which will be discussed in another session, but it sets the scene much better. Uh, if we compare experimental results to uh, DFT results, and in this case I just took data which I had lying myself, which are vast PBE results, and we do the comparison by means of such a reg uh, regression analysis, we can extract predictable part of the error, a stochastic-like error, we can extract outliers, and we see, in fact, a very good agreement, which is not that surprising for these elemental crystals. We see that most of the data points for a, follow a regression line, a regression line which is actually a little bit skewed from the y equals x line, which is because we're dealing with PBE, and we all know PBE tends to uh, underbind, overestimate volumes, which we indeed see from the regression line. There's a little bit of scatter on the regression line, but all in all, equilibrium volume predictions uh, can be done quite accurately. Not really much outliers here, but that's just because I already removed the outliers, so it's a little bit skewed in that respect. So let's have a look at one particular case now. What is the influence of the regression line and taking correlations into uh, account? If we do a PBE prediction for tungsten, for example, we get 16.1 cubic ohmstrom per atom. If we look at the experimental result, we get 15.8 plus minus 0.1 cubic ohmstrom per atom. Quite good agreement, but it does not take into account the systematic underbinding of PBE. So we could just naively do an ordinary least squares by means of this regression analysis and correct for that predictable part of the error and also put an error bar on top of it. We then get a DFT corrected guess of the experimental result of 15.5 plus minus 1.1 cubic ohmstrom per atom. And we see the experimental result to be nicely within that range. Well, we did not take into account that tungsten, in fact, has a very large bulk modulus, one of the largest bulk moduli uh, within the elemental crystal set. So it should, in fact, have a smaller error bar. If we redo our analysis by means of weighted least squares analysis, we get a new regression line and we get an error bar which is really fitted towards, uh, towards every element specifically, individually. We then get 15.7 plus minus 
cubic constant pratum. You see, the experimental result is still within that range, but we actually have an estimate of the experimental result, which is much more in agreement with experiment and also has a much better, uh, more qualitative uh, um, representation of the uncertainty. So that's why we're going to use this to compare the codes as well. So what I'm going to do is to do a regression analysis between results of code one compared to code two, and the x-axis will uh, the, sorry, the y-axis will typically be an all-electron code. If we're comparing all-electron codes, we just compare all all-electron codes to all other all-electron codes, just like we did for delta. So without further ado, let's have a look at some uh, more advanced analysis. First, what happens if we compare equilibrium volumes? We compare the equilibrium volumes of a given code to the all-electron codes, we average, and we actually see not much predictable error, which is nice. I mean, if we do predictions with two different codes, we wouldn't expect that one code gives a systematically lower or higher volume than the other codes. So that's a very good thing. We also get an error bar which is quite small. Depending on the code and the element, something between 0.02 and 0.08 cubic angstrom per atom. So we're doing quite nicely there. We can do the same analysis for the bulk modulus, very similar, no real predictable part of the error, and an error bar between 0.5 and 1.5 gigapascal, which is for most elements quite reasonable as well. We know this is somewhat harder to get right. But then we get to the pressure derivative of the bulk modulus. And there things become somewhat puzzling. We see a systematic deviation, a predictable error. We see that actually compared to all electron codes, most codes seem to have a systematic trend which has a slightly lower regression slope and an intercept of about 0.3. So does this mean that non-all electron codes have a systematic deviation from all electron codes in terms of the, uh, of the bulk modulus derivative. And even a very large error bar, 0.2 to 0.3, if you know that most elements have uh, a bulk modulus derivative between four and six, this is a huge error bar. Well, in fact, things are not as bad as it looks here. Uh, if we look at the bulk modulus derivative into somewhat more detail, we know this is a derivative, uh, it's a, a der derivative property. Uh, everything is derived from that equation versus volume curve, uh, energy versus volume curve, and the bulk modulus derivative is actually the third order derivative of energy versus volume. This is quite hard to get right from a fit of seven points. So in fact, what we're looking at here is not the performance of our different codes, but the performance of our fit, which is actually really insufficient. Maybe one particular property, uh, one particular case, if we look at ATK, one of our most recent data which has been added, you see there seems to be no correlation whatsoever between the ATK bulk modulus derivatives and the all electron ones. I mean, the regression slope is 0.02, so a horizontal curve. Well, it's actually not that bad. It does show that we cannot get the bulk modulus derivatives from these seven point equation of states from ATK, but if we look at the delta value of ATK, it's only between two and three milli electron volts per atom. So actually the agreement in terms of energies for ATK compared to our electron codes is quite good. So two things we can learn from this is on the one hand, we should be careful not to extract two highly ordered, uh, highly ordered derivatives from these limited data sets. We should just take into account more data points if we really want to get this right, which was not the original purpose of the delta uh, analysis. Uh, and on the other hand, I mean, it actually does not matter too much for the delta values. Now, other things that we can learn, we see, as I already mentioned, no real predictable parts of the error, which is nice. Uh, even for the bulk modulus derivative, I mean, these are probably just effects of noise, numerical noise because of our fitting procedure. So in fact, a main idea here is that different codes do not really give a predictable deviation compared to other codes. We also see the same behavior if we look at delta popping up if we compare volumes, bulk modulus, or bulk modulus derivatives. We see that if we go from norm-conserving uh, pseudo-potential results to all, electro, to, uh, to all electron results, we see that the quality on average improves. There are in every class of methods, uh, methods out there which really uh, get to the same level of precision as the, uh, as the all electron codes, but in fact, on average, we do see this known behavior that all electron codes typically make it easier to get it right, while uh, norm conserving two potentials require a little bit more tinkering. Now, and then one thing I have not mentioned yet is that actually we should also have a look at outliers 
Uh, here is a list of outliers which have been defined, I think, as outliers which are more than five times the error bar from the regression line. Now, you see some, almost every code has a certain outlier. This does not mean that these are cases which we should be very suspicious about and that they're really wrong. Let's look, for example, at elk. Cadmium is flagged as an outlier there, but actually, in fact, if we compare it to the, all, to, to the other all-electron codes, the volume only changes by 0.1 cubic angstrom per atom, so things are not that bad. There are the magnetic materials which show up, which actually just means that getting, converging the magnetic state to the same state between codes is much dif more difficult to do. But if people are li really looking into a certain pseudo potential to get it better, or in a code to look at what is most difficult, these outliers are interesting cases to have a look at. So in conclusion, I hope I convinced you that there's a lot of information hidden in the delta data set beyond the deltas themselves. Uh, there's a richness in terms of sensitivities in equations of state. There's also a richness in terms of how to improve our code even further and how to express the uncertainty that is associated with comparison between codes. So with that, I leave the floor to the next speaker and I thank you for your attention.